how do we like determine what laws are the right laws to follow? Like how do we know what's right and what's wrong if we can't have a big T-truth that everyone can follow? So our law is really something that's actually just a little T-truth that we create um, through our own perceptions and our perspective of how people should live. Popular perspective is what has to be true for everyone, whereas those who don't have that same perspective kind of just get shoved under the rug like they don't matter. They think their ideas are right or that the world belongs to them. Just horrible tragedies are all based around th this danger of their, percep their perception and their limited ability to, to ask questions about their own beliefs. Just hearing other students' backgrounds and what their ideas are, that made me kind of just evolve more as a person. It makes kids put themselves out there. It encourages them to grow at a much more rapid pace and in a more organic setting than just sitting in a classroom, listening to a lecture and memorizing things, taking notes. We're um, working on problem solving techniques and just learn how to think for ourselves. A quote from William James, who's the father of modern psychology. There's nothing so absurd that if you repeat it often enough, people will believe it. And so I could say a lie over and over and say like, I'm the smartest man in the world. I'm the smartest man in the world. Eventually somewhere in the world, someone will believe me. Someone will actually believe that, hey, Dick Tabor, he's the smartest man alive. He could run this country. He could run our world and he could create world peace. But in reality, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just a normal 17 year old kid. <laughs> nothing, nothing to do. Aristotle says famously in the beginning of the metaphysics, all human beings by nature desire to know. And he ultimately argues that philosophy is one of the best expressions of that desire to know because it is a, uh, an expression of our desire to answer the most fundamental questions in our existence. Young people are born with that desire and they don't want to be told the answers or lectured to or have these questions ignored. They're hungry to answer them. We always talk about in education, especially critical thinking. We need to get those critical thinking skills. And that's another one of these vague, amorphous terms. But really, that is what philosophy is all about, you know? Sometimes the kids have the, uh, the wrong impression that, oh, it's all about opinion. And I like to, uh, I, I like the old quote from um, James Lowen. Uh, he's the author of uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me. It says, everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts, you know? So the way I see that with philosophy is, look, yeah, you can argue a certain stance, but you need to be able to have the rationale to back it up. And that's really what that process teaches kids, I think, more than almost any other discipline you'll find in a high school. I think it's important for, for everyone to do this. And I think that the, when, you're, when you're young and you're, and you're you know, 17 or 18 or, or 19 or 20, I think that's an especially good time to do it because you haven't formed your beliefs yet. Or if you have, you haven't actually thought them through and given them a rational foundation. So I think it's a good time, uh, high school especially, and college, to ask those, those, those questions. All of that revolves around um, the manners in which we conduct ourselves connected with other people and the teaching that goes on indirectly uh, in and out of the classroom, which we hope is going to be another part of this educational model uh, as kids learn from kids, uh, as facilitators and kids talk, uh, but also see each other in the process rather than just what they're conversing on directly. It puts civility back on the front burner and it teaches us, you know, that our civil life and our civic life is is very important. It animates our civic life. It elevates the conversation. It makes us more nuanced in the way that we can look at issues. It's an important piece of the puzzle. And unfortunately, I think sometimes here in the United States, we don't appreciate that as well as some areas of the world. But giving philosophy and specifically ethics their space in students' lives to be explored, to be challenged, is really important. It's about answering life's big questions and how to live your life. The stuff that we usually wouldn't ask uh, your friends in a normal conversation. We definitely exercise being respectful and like making sure there's a pause before you jump in to talk to someone and like it's good to make sure that you don't get too heated. Before this class I never really like questioned morals, never really questioned another topic which was perception versus reality. A lot of the times we grow up with our parents' ideas in our heads, but soon enough we're going to be on our own and we're going to need to start really thinking for ourselves and I think it's um, a perfect time to start training kids for that. HYPE stands for Hosting Young Philosophy Enthusiasts. My classroom used to be right across the hall from Chris and Amy who teach the ethics seminar at school. 
Um, in one year, we had a shared student who played for me uh, on the field hockey team. And for her senior project, she wanted to create this philosophy conference, bringing together a group of schools to chat philosophically for a day. When it started out, it was a very small um, shop, if you will. It was, I think, only two or three schools at Sauhegan. And then it grew, and they moved it to St. Anselm. And then it grew again, and they moved it to UNA. It was the start of something really special, and you could see it. You could see it almost immediately, the students being excited, feeling kind of like, is this really okay for us to do? Like just sit here and, and chat for a while about what we think, uh, and it's grown ever since. And as a facilitator, you want to contribute just as much as everyone else. For others, it'll be a bit more challenging to keep the conversation going. Well, today, um, all the hype facilitators are coming together, and it's kind of a briefing on how to facilitate a group being a leader isn't just about one person, it's about an entire group. So you really need to know how to work well within a group, how to make sure everyone's ideas are heard. What it does is takes the people who are going to be facilitating discussions at Hype with small groups of around 10 people. We invite them to come and listen in on our breakout sessions. We talk about critical thinking and group dynamics and we talk about making a difference and how this can all be applied to their own schools and communities. What it does is takes the people who are going to be facilitating discussions at Hype and we show them how to pull leadership techniques and qualities from everyone that, that are in their discussions. This is my third year doing Hype. My first year I was just in one of the groups. In my second year I was a facilitator and this is going to be my third year being a facilitator. Every year the Hype uh, formulation leadership teams uh, come together uh, and have a conversation about what is this year's theme going to be. So this year's theme is freedom of speech and expression. It's also tied into political cartooning, which is something that New the New Hampshire Humanities brought up this year as a proposal to us. We loved it. The Federation of State Humanities Councils, of which we are a part, together with the Pulitzer Foundation, decided, hey, this is the centennial year of the Pulitzer. We really need to make a public splash. So today we're putting on a panel discussion on political cartooning, wrestling with issues of freedom of speech and are there limits to what cartoonists should do, can do, will do, um, where, where those lines are. The Pulitzer New Hampshire Humanities and also our Ethics Forum and Sauhegan Group and the Spalding Group, we all decided that this would be a topic that we uh, would find engaging. Wrestling with issues of freedom of speech and are there limits to what cartoonists should do, can do, will do, where, where those lines are. And we want to connect that directly to where uh, kids are. Thank you so much, we're all uh, thrilled to be here. People in that field really know what they're talking about. And I'd love to give each of our panelists a chance to show you some of their work. And for high school students, it's really beneficial for us to have people like that come and talk to us. So these are 12 Danish cartoons that were published in a newspaper in 2005. And they were published uh, as a test. Uh, the um, newspaper had asked, um, um, the members of the union of uh, uh, newspaper illustrators to draw Muhammad as they saw him. And these uh, images uh, produce some very mixed results. Uh, in fact, uh, you have heard about them as insulting uh, uh, cartoons that uh, violate uh, an Islamic prohibition on the depiction of Muhammad. Uh, you may be surprised to know that there is no such prohibition. Those pictures were supposed to be in my book, but they were removed as a book uh, went into press. People have come to think that these are dangerous images. The truth is I traveled all over the Middle East. I went to Asia with these cartoons in my bag and every time I interviewed somebody I took them out and I asked, have you seen these? What do you think they mean? And nothing happened to me. But now today we have reached a point where everybody thinks that these images are insulting, that they're dangerous, and that has been, and, and that Muslims don't tolerate free speech, which is not true. So it is a very, very sad story. It is really a story where the wrong side won. The problem is not that my rights were violated, but the problem was that your rights were violated because you were denied the right to learn what I just told you. The topic of censorship is, is tricky. The goal has always been to engage students in philosophical thinking that is relevant to their lives and relevant to the things that we all value in a free and democratic society. So p power plays a huge influence in 
what you get to know. And the problem with censorship is that you actually don't even know that you don't know it. Having students engage deeply with fundamental questions about things like what the limits of freedom of speech are um, is, is incredibly important. You know, if we live in the United States, we know there's a Constitution, we know there's a First Amendment, and we get it. And w what that means um, is actually very, very difficult to figure out. Cartoonists have great freedom under the First Amendment thanks to the famous pornographer Larry Flint who uh, took a, who was sued by a minister who uh, was offended by a cartoon. It went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court unanimously agreed that a cartoon is a cartoon. It's not to be taken literally. It's a joke get over it. People have a rather malleable way of thinking of freedom of speech and it tends to be I want as much freedom of speech for opinions and for people that are on my side and as little as possible for the other side. If you disagree with me or us or anything it's really important to know that does not make us enemies. You know that's a, there's a really dreadful divisive awful hateful uh, thing at work in this country where people just can't bear to disagree with other people. And I think, it's, I think it's actually better. I kind of get bored with people who think like me. You know, I really like the company of people who I disagree with, like there's a possibility you could learn something from them. I think not just students, but all of us take it for granted if we've grown up and lived here all our lives that it's, it's so obvious that we don't think about it much until you see something like um, journalists and cartoonists being killed for what they've said or what they've drawn or what they've written in France, and we think, that's France, that's terrorism, that's extremist, that's nothing like our experience here. Um, this I did after Charlie Hebdo. It's uh, a newspaper parking, the sports writer, the garden writer, and the cartoonist. Uh, that refers, of course, to car the cartoonists who were singled out in Paris. There are cartoonists all over the world who are imprisoned or faced with prison. Yeah, everybody heard about Charlie Hebdo because there were 12 of them at once, or how many there were. But uh, in fact, as this organization uh, that I'm on the board of, Cartoonists Rights Network uh, International, who attempts to uh, which attempts to look after the interests of uh, cartoonists in trouble, and Signe has been on that board in the past, will tell you um, it happens every week. You just don't hear about it because it's one cartoonist at a time who gets, you know, uh, disappeared or beaten up, or there's a young woman, uh, Atina, I don't think I'm butchering her name, I think it's Farganzani, who was put in jail in December in Iran. For simply 12 for 12 years. Yeah, for 12 years, simply for drawing a picture of the Iranian parliament as farm animals, well, you know, what? That's basic. That's like cartooning. Yeah, one. that's like on the matchbook. Draw your <laughs> politic, Draw your governor as a weasel. It's yeah. like a basic thing. We can get into this rut sometimes as philosophy students and philosophy educators of making everything so conceptual. Having those experts along the way made us realize that these sort of general ideas that we are debating and discussing have very real world implications to them. Because of the Danish cartoons and because of Charlie Hebdo, we really talk about it in terms of Muslim, uh, Amer uh, Muslim versus the rest of the world. It's not that. Every religion has its sacred symbols and they hate it when they end up in cartoons. So I tried to figure out how I could slip Muhammad into a cartoon and not get killed. So I did this cartoon with all the religious re readers looking at the big fat book of offensive religious cartoons. I got no criticism of it. It's been around, it went around the world again after Charlie Hebdo. And the point here is that people don't, aren't objecting to Muhammad uh, per se, it's a negative portrayal of no Muhammad. I think the meaning behind having them at the hype event is to show their process of thinking when they're drawing and when they're creating because it allows the students to kind of take that and think about oh wait so what's my process of thinking it's very much like good writing it, it, it's like um, someone writing a good lead sentence that sums up the entire um, point that he or she wants to make 
you know, Donald Trump is like, and instead of writing it out, we draw it, and then we leave out the rest of the paragraphs. But it's also, it's also like poetry, because you can't paraphrase it and do it justice. And, uh, that's a good it's way better than poetry. To, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's well, why in the New Yorker <laughs> people read the cartoons and not the poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think it put a a unique slant on people who are out in the world doing the tough job. I do think there's obviously a risk involved in being a cartoonist, so it's interesting to see some of the dilemmas. <laughs> that they face. So I'm the editor, was the editor for 30 years of The Nation magazine, which is America's oldest weekly magazine, founded in 1865 by a group of people in and around the abolitionist movement. Only once did that staff march on my office and insist that we not publish something. And that something in this bastion of word people was a cartoon. It was a caricature of Henry Kissinger by David Levine that the New York Review of Books had turned down. And um, I, at first, then it showed Kissinger on top and the world in the form of a woman on bottom with a globe where her head should have been. And as David explained it to me, Kissinger was screwing the world. And are you interested? And I said, of course, David, I'm interested, but it'll get me in a lot of trouble. But the good thing that happened was when I got here, I was told that your teachers thought you shouldn't see it because somehow it would corrupt the younger ones among you. And I can't think of a more powerful way of underlining the problem with censorship than what has happened to depriving you from seeing this wonderful picture. We have an obligation as educators to recognize a couple of things. We did have students that age-wise were particularly young in that room. We have students who from a level of emotional maturity are younger than their age. We also have students in that room that were 16, 17 years old that if you had a blindfold on, you'd think you were interacting with 23, 24 year old adults. Um, we teach such a wide spectrum of students that we have to consider what they're exposed to and specifically how they're exposed to it. How many of you would like to see this wonderful picture? <laughs> okay. Google David right. Levine, Henry Kissinger cartoon. <laughs> okay. They want to make an autonomous decision, even if they end up looking at it and deciding that, oh yeah, I think it is in bad taste or it's stupid or, or whatever. At least they're making an autonomous decision about it rather than having somebody else make their judgment about what they should see. And again, they're essentially adults at this point, right? These are juniors and seniors in high school. So I thought that was a nice little moment, a learning moment um, by demonstration. So uh, you can see it on Google, but I just want to say that there, to me, it's a real mistake not to let you see it. It is a form of speech. It is a form of free, free speech. But it's great to have you have to suffer by not seeing it and ex because you're experiencing the censorship that artists have experienced over the years. I thought their insight of like, you know, their expertise, what they've experienced was really helpful and it allowed for us to have a better conversation. So what is freedom of expression? Without the freedom to offend, it ceases to exist. Not everyone's going to have the same view, but if we're all just going to get rid of art, get rid of expression, get rid of writing, cartoons, we're not going to have anything left. I think everyone should have an awareness of um, censorship, and I think everyone should learn to have a dialogue at some point. So it's like in a lot of ways, like fear drives people, even though it might not be in a good or positive manner. This hype conference and letting giving people those opportunities is something that's really beneficial and can help, like spark people's imaginations and spark people's curiosities to learn more than what they're taught in school. <laughs> it was awesome because we've been working so long trying to get this together. It's a great experience, it's a whole lot of fun, and it's something I'm absolutely better off for having attended twice. To see so many people, so many young people so passionate about this really excites me. Um, I want to study philosophy, whether it's a minor, a major in, uh, in high, uh, college. People were saying, you know, sometimes the discussions get hard because there's a lot of, it's, it's a hard topic, but um, they were able to still talk about it and learn a lot from other people. And just hear everyone say that they really appreciated the experience, they don't have anything like it at their school, just because we've been working for so long to make it all come together. You did a great job 
of stepping up and problem solving um, in those instances, and that was really amazing. Uh, in we second, hope that not only have we developed it. kids who uh, attended the conference and saw the value of the conversation, but also learned to work together. A conference in which they actually uh, have their own. They're running it and taking care of all of the things underneath it and then planning this event and then seeing it come to fruition with their peers. I hope it goes to other states. I hope it catches on because philosophy is, is to me, it, it's an integral to the humanities. It's integral to critical thinking and learning. The kinds of skills that are developed in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics classroom are incredibly important, uh, but they are not all there is to being a person. If we don't have it in the schools, I think we're really missing out. It's the perfect time to start thinking about deeper issues and about lifelong issues and about how I want to steer my ship. In fact, they need it before high school. Um, they, if we could get this into the elementary schools, um, this I think would be an absolutely fantastic thing. Because you need to learn those moral values when you're young so that you can apply them when you're out in the real world and working with the real world and other people and when you actually can make a difference. Yeah, it's something that the kids should be continuing to work on every year. I'm going to strategically start pulling many of you who have inside information because you've run this in your various capacities to offer them some support and help them create the vision for next year. I have students who have done this years and years ago who in the first couple of years still when I see them, we'll talk about it or we'll ask questions like, how is it going this year? What are you doing this year? It's like nine months of all this pain and, <laughs> and, and stress. Pain, stress, kicking, hormones, whatever it is. But at the end of the road, look at the beautiful child that we produce. We started this and, and it's, it's all around New England now. And, we're hoping soon it doesn't have to be surrounding schools, it can be any schools. <laughs> <laughs>